I've been to 100 countries and I owe my life to biohazard. Um, can I just go back? Do you remember your first meeting with the band as it is bio, as biohazard? Um, and do I remember the first meeting of biohazard? I mean, it was uh, it was building. It was it was like making. It was like building a building. You know, we create a foundation. We we meet each other. You know, when we first started the band, it was uh, I was in I was playing with uh, Mio with the first drummer, mm -hmm. and uh, Mio was also playing with Bobby. And Mio, everybody thought me and Bobby knew each other because we were so similar, but we didn't. And Mio introduced us, and we started playing together. It was great. And then. Uh, we were looking for a second guitar player, and uh, uh, a friend of mine who was like a glam rock guy, like from a drug scene that I was in when I was a teenager, said, hey man, I know this guy Billy, he's like a skinhead guy from, the, from Brooklyn, and he would fit with you guys because your music's so aggressive, and we meet Billy and he's perfect, and we don't have a singer, you know? And I can sing, but I was a little bit shy to sing in a band that sounded this good, and I said, okay, I'll sing temporarily for now mm -hmm. until we find a singer. But uh, then uh, very, you know, maybe in the, before we even do the first album, you know, the drummer who brought us all together, he was having problems and we had to kick him out of the band, and I knew Danny from when we were kids. I've known Danny since I was about 12 years old. Were you from the same area? And, uh... Me and Danny are both from Canarsie, with the exact same area of Brooklyn, you mm -hmm. know. Other people from this area were, uh, Peter Chris from Kiss, Warren Cucurilla from Missing Persons, the original Guardian Angels from the Subways, Curtis Lewa from Canarsie, a lot of famous people, you know. What was it, yeah, the first record you sang about gang-related issues, maybe a little bit, was that an issue, I mean, was it like that in that area where you came from? It was a tough place we grew up in, you know, East New York, Brooklyn, and, you know, all, all the rappers like, you know, Notorious Big, Wu-Tang Clan, Jay-Z, uh, they all come from this same place, you they know what I mean? But they, they're more about like, how can we get a bunch of shiny bling bling shit? And mm -hmm. you know, we were more about survival of the streets and integrity of, of self, you know? And we lost a lot of friends growing up and a lot of our songs were about our friends that died and you know, brotherhood, friendship, tr you know, the traditional values that we took out of the families that we grew up with in this kind of crazy, neighborhood situation, a lot of gangs, drugs, violence. What, what was, yeah, what was it, I mean, probably it's not anymore that severe now, huh? I think. The, the, the neighborhood has... I don't live there anymore, I couldn't tell you. Okay. But was it, was it like, really like a survival for you as well? If, if it wasn't for biohazard, maybe you would still be there? Or? I don't have a crystal ball to know what would be mm -hmm. the future, but I know that the music was always my inspiration, and for all of us, the music took us out of this neighborhood and took us around the world and put us in beautiful places like Netherlands and took us to Australia and Japan. And man, I've been to 100 countries and I owe my life to Biohazard, you know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. It was something that, that I started, that we created, that became bigger than us. So it's very humbling and it gives you a lot of respect for what you do. And especially when you make music that's from the heart, it's not commercial, you know, and intentionally not commercial because, you know, we never wanted, to, with this project, with Biohazard, we never wanted to compromise our message in any way. Can you remember maybe the first moment that you started to earn money from doing this? <sighs> well, I remember in the first few tours we did, you know, we would come to Europe and play 70 shows in 70 days and in a van and freezing and you know enough money to live when we're there but when we go home we have no money so we all had jobs back at home and i used to work at a pizzeria and billy used to drive work security and drive a truck and i used to work uh, also as a bouncer at a club and danny worked in a ladies clothing store and bobby was uh breeding iguanas and doing you know uh we all had different hustles i remember um, after Urban Discipline came out, after our second album came out, I remember we just decided we're going to tour full time because we can't afford to come home and take a job and take our focus away from the music, you know. Mm -hmm. But what for you, was it a bigger step maybe to go abroad? Was it the first like moment that you went away so far from, from your home when you came to Europe? And uh... It was very exciting. I mean, the first tour we did was 1989 in Europe with Mucky Pup and we played, we played in Eindhoven, you know. Yeah. We played all over, all over, and uh, our promoter was uh, a Belgian guy, Metalese, a guy named Johan. 
Uh, so 80% of our gigs was Belgium and Holland, you know, when we played every place like Friesland and Tilburg and uh, in the North of And the same promoter, Mojo, who's taking us now, Rob Tromlin, uh, was here with me, you know, 20 years ago. So it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a cool thing.